people are having food. But anyway, there's always a first time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, that they shall be great. Let us pray. We say uh, a prayer all together. Yes. 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 The, 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 the prayer of the Holy Spirit. It's just the Send forth the Spirit of the Spirit So, welcome to uh, this Lenten Recollection. Recollection, we should have to be fasting, but um, the Filipino community of Queen Avengers Church is just so generous to give us a lot of food. So, we'll continue eating, and, um, and while we are also sharing this great uh, roots of our faith. Now, when I was thinking of what to talk about, the topic for our recollection, I want to, um, to talk about the most important thing in our Catholic faith. And this is about the resurrection of our Lord. Now, now uh, we have been into this time of Lent. We have a lot of practices for Lent. What is this for? We are preparing for the central mystery of our faith, which we call the Paschal Mystery. And what is the Paschal Mystery? The Paschal Mystery is the Passion, the Death, and the Resurrection. That's why the most holy, uh, the holiest week of all in our calendar is the Holy Week and within the Holy Week it is Holy Thursday and Good Friday which is the Passion and Death and of course Easter Sunday which is the Resurrection of our Lord. So the topic, the first topic would be the singular phenomenon of Jesus' Resurrection. So, you know, the Paschal Mystery is focused on, is the focus of our Lenten observances, which should, be, which should enlighten and inspire our Christian life. And my opinion, I don't know about you, my opinion is, there has been a lot of emphasis given to the passion and death of our Lord. And so that's why you have Lenten recollection, but you never have Easter recollection. And we have a lot of activities for Lent. And we have only very few activities for Easter. And a lot of our activities at Easter are not even so spiritual, like the Easter egg hunt. Now, and if in our celebration of the Paschal Mystery, we are only focused on the passion and death. I think we are missing the whole point. And, and I think Pope Francis has all the reason to say that a lot of us Christians are Christian are good Friday Christians. And that's the reason why we a lot of us we have good Friday faces. You know what a Good Friday face is? Pope Francis is a very nice description of a Good Friday face. It's the face of the one who, as if he has nothing, uh, not eaten anything for breakfast, but vinegar and lemon. That 
is a Good Friday face. And the problem is, if in our lives, we are only focused on the passion and death of our Lord, apparently, our Lord is defeated by the forces of evil and sin. That's why a lot of us, we are not equipped, we are not strengthened to cope up with a lot of difficulties in life. Because our Lord is a frustrated Lord. Not the resurrected Lord. Now, St. John Paul II, in his encyclical, Dies Domini, he said, and I quote, The Lord's Day, Sunday, and today is a Sunday, has always been accorded special attention because of its close connection with the very core of the Christian mystery. In fact, in the weekly day, recalls the day of Christ's resurrection. It is Easter which returns week by week, celebrating Christ's victory over sin and death. How beautiful this is. And this is precisely the reason why Sunday for us is a holy day. You know, before the resurrection of our Lord, the most holy, the holiest day for the Jews and even for our Lord Jesus Christ is the Sabbath day, the last day of the week. The big game changer that changed everything is the resurrection of our Lord. That from having Saturday as a big day, we now have Sunday. For what reason? Because our Lord was risen on a Sunday. And we would like to renew and reflect on that big event in our faith, which is the resurrection of our Lord. And this is what Sunday is all about. Sunday should be a very important day. Do we rest on Sunday? What is the purpose of our resting? The purpose of our resting is that we recall Christ's resurrection so that we will be strengthened the whole week. We will, we will be defeated by evil and sin. You know, if you have the consciousness, the awareness of our Lord Jesus Christ defeating sin and death, that is a big recharger for the whole week. You will be winning with our Lord, who is victorious over all forces of evil. Now, baptized Catholics are essentially happy people because our life of faith is anchored in the resurrection of our Lord. That's why we are not people of Good Friday. A lot of us really, uh, you know, I, I tend to like now, uh, there are crosses with the resurrected Lord. Have you seen that? At first, I thought I did not like it. Like, I really like my crucifix with the crucified Lord. But then I realized, yes, I think, they, I think there's a lot of reason why we have to have a resurrected Lord. Because that really gives us strength. We are not people of Good Friday, as Pope Francis would say, would, uh, would uh, remind us from time to time. Now, a Christian is essentially a happy man or woman, a happy person. Well, this fundamental characteristic of a, of a Christian should be visible in each and every one of us. That's why in this reflection, I, want, I don't want to see Good Friday faces. We should have Easter Sunday faces. Well, first of all, we have eaten very well, so we should be <laughs> grateful as we are. We have to be, we have to be very happy. And, um, well, Now, according to Ronald Knox, do you know what's the difference of a person who doesn't have faith in his drinking and a person who has faith in his drinking? Get it, get it, get it. 
que tiene fe y coma y una persona que no tiene fe y toma I think this is Ronald Knox as smart guy as he is I think he nailed it and, and I think this, this, is, this is what we have to know also so that our drinking will have meaning he says you know the one who doesn't have faith and drinks he drinks to drown his sadness, his problems, his difficulties in life. Correct? You know, a lot of I have I have here in our parish I have um, especially for the Mexicans. You now I have um, I have been receiving a lot of people and they would do what we call juramento. I don't know if you um, juramento in English would be oath. Vow. They would come and would like to do oath with me as a witness. And uh, sometimes they, sometimes if they have problems, another employer would require it from them. I would have you back to work if you can give me your foramento, your oath. Um, a lot of these people, why, why are they drinking? This is the problem. They, they have any emptiness in their lives. They don't have the faith. They don't have, they don't have the joy of faith. And it's so easy if you have, if you don't have faith, if you, um, if you don't believe in God, it's, it's easy to fall into depression, frustration, and you can fill it easily with alcoholic substance. And then you get happy for a while, correct? But the big, um, but, but the difference is, if you have faith and you drink, most of the times you drink to celebrate life, to celebrate your faith. And this is the reason why our Lord Jesus Christ, in the wedding in Cana, in the wedding in Cana, He turned water into wine. He wants the feasting to go on. Why? Because feasting, drinking, is celebration of our faith. The joy of our faith. So if you happen to open a good bottle of red wine, invite me. That's part of our faith. And if you want to give me also a good bottle of wine, I will be ready to accept it. Drinking is not bad. We should know why we are drinking. And we are drinking because we have faith. You know, Good drinking is not excessive drinking. Drinking well is not drinking too much. Drinking well is knowing what to drink. And drinking well is drinking good stuff, good things. This is part of our faith. That's why we come here for St. Patrick's Day. We have wine. We, have, we come here for the, um, I don't know if they're still doing it, uh, the uh, Oktoberfest, we have beer and everything. And don't be scandalized, the church is serving bread, is serving beer. That is part of our faith. Our Lord Jesus said it again in John 2, in the wedding in Cana, He changed the water into wine because He wants people to be happy, He wants people to be feasting. Amen. Amen. Now, the importance of living in Easter spirituality. I go to St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 14. He says, If Christ has not been raised, then empty is our preaching. Empty too. Your faith, your faith is vain. This is something serious. As a priest, as a priest, if I don't preach, that our Lord Jesus Christ is risen. If I don't emphasize this, I think my preaching is in vain. That's not my words. I just happen to concur very well, to agree very well with St. Paul that the, the, the mystery of the resurrection of our Lord should be center of my preaching as a priest because if we don't understand this, 
I would like to underline this. Empty your faith. You realize that? Our faith will be empty. And our faith will be vain. This is something serious. And again, from St. Paul, second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. So, if we are people of Good Friday, I'm sorry, we are old people. And that perhaps is the reason why we will have wrinkled faces. If you want to be a new creation, believe in the resurrection of our Lord. And meditate on uh, the, 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 uh, the effects of the resurrection of our Lord in our lives. Now, among the miracles of the Bible, the most interesting thing, the most spectacular things are those of uh, stories of the, uh, resurrection, the miracles of the re resurrection. How many do you know? How many do you know are, um, are people being resurrected in, how many people do you know have been resurrected in the Old and in the New Testament? Any idea in the Old Testament, how many? Is, or were there people who were resurrected in the Old Testament? Okay, so how about the New Testament? I think it's easier. How many? Let us check. Yes. Anything more? You know, there are a lot of resurrection stories in the Old Testament. Okay, so how many miracles of resurrection are there in the Bible? In the Old Testament, we have three resurrections. In the New Testament, we have six or more. We don't know. It's here. Miracles of the resurrection. Well, first miracle of resurrection that we that we know in the Bible is the, the one, the son of the widow of Sarai. Remember, remember the story? Spectacular story. This is about Elijah. So Elijah um, was sent to this widow in Saripath. The Sarip, you know, you know, you know the story that the widow of Saripath when she went out to get to collect firewood, and and and, and Elijah, uh, he said he said to her, um, give me something to drink and give me something to eat. And the widow was saying, you know, you know, I just have a handful of flour. And I'm gathering fire, uh, firewood because I would like to bake cake, uh, bread for me and my son before we die. Because there was a severe famine. But Elijah insisted. No. He was saying, like, forget about you and forget about your son. Bake the bread for me. And that's what the, the widow of did. And what happened? Well, because of that, the jar of oil of the of the woman was was never empty and the the jar of flour also was always full Amen. now the, the story that they did not end there the story continued so what happened now uh, this widow sorry path uh, uh, she had her son die I will we'll just read this now so Elijah uh, said to her, Give me your son. By the way, this is from uh, the first book of Kings, chapter 17, verses 17 to 24. So Elijah said to her, Give me your son. Taking him from her lap, he carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. He called out to the Lord, Lord God, will you afflict even the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself out upon the child three times, and he called out to the Lord, 
Lord, my God, let the life breathe return to the body of this child. The Lord heard prayer of Elijah. The life breathed returned to the child's body and lit and he lived. Taking the child, Elijah carried him down into the house of the outer room and gave him to his mother. Elijah said, See, your son is alive. The woman said to Elijah, Now indeed I know that you are a man of God, and it is truly the word of the word that you speak. For a mother, for a mother, for a widow, he, she has nothing, no one except her only son. And what, how, how sad it is no? for her to be, to have her son dead, and then she receives the news, your son is alive. I don't know how, how happy would she be to have her son back. A while ago, there's a movie in the Philippines, and I just saw uh, a movie it produced in the Philippines, and, and um, well, it starred in Los Santos for Filipinos, so we're here. And uh, I just saw, I did not saw, I did not see the movie, but I, I, I saw the trailer of the movie. And, and it was saying that there is a word to describe there is a word to describe a child who lost of his, of his parents. How is he called? Orphan. There is a word for um, a wife to lose his to her her husband. There is a word for a man to lose his wife. And there is no word to describe a mother who lost his son. Because there is no word to describe how painful a situation it is. And then, putting yourself into the situation, you receive the news, your son is alive. You will not have greater news than such a thing. We go on. The second resurrection story from the Old Testament, taken from Second Book of Kings, chapter 4, verses 18 to 34. Who knows the Shinnamite son? Okay, we just read this. This one, this time it's not anymore Elijah, but Elisha. Elisha is a minor author. When Elisha reached the house, he found the boy dead. Lying on the bed, he went in, closed the door and them both, and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay upon the child on the bed, placing his mouth upon the child's mouth. Wow, well, this is now the first, first recorded CPR. Uh, CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This, I think, the, um, I think we, if we, if we think uh, CPR is a new thing, advancement in, in, in medical technology, CPR was done already in the Old Testament. Now, so after the CPR, what happened? The child's eyes, his eyes behind into the eyes, and his hands on his hands, as if he should stretch himself over the child, the boy's flesh became warm. He arose, face up and downward, and then once more stretched himself over him, and the boy Sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha said to the Shunammite, Take your son. You know, um, I, um, when I was a baby priest, I had never touched ever a dead body. And then I, um, I, was, I, was, I became a public pastor of a very remote parish. And then I had to take care of an island. At that time, I was having, um, I was also the chancellor of the diocese, I was the secretary of the bishop. And then I had a call that um, there's a dying person in Thailand. I said, no, I can't go because I'm in a very important meeting. I will go there for the meeting. You know what? When I, um, so the time I was able to arrive in, um, in, uh, in the place in the house of that um, woman in Thailand, I said, oh no, but we can, we can still do the anointing of the sick. Yeah? Uh, although they said that uh, she died away. I said, oh, we can still, we can still do that. 
So we then communicate and argue at the same And you know what? I was just, I was convincing myself, oh, she's still, she's still is alive, she still is alive. And then the night for me to anoint me, anoint the money, and then when I felt that the money was cold, it's like, and then I realized, oh, I'm very much a dead body. I'm just saying that now, dead bodies are cold. Dead bodies are cold, and when you, um, and, 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 well, the property, the characteristic of a live body is that we are warm. Amen. Now, Jairus, an official of the synagogue, came forward. He 
fell at the feet of Jesus and begged him to come to his house. Because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. Someone from the civil official's house arrived and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any longer. On hearing this, Jesus answered him, Do not be afraid. Just have faith, and she will be saved. When he arrived at the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the child's father and mother. All were weeping and mourning for her. When he said, Do not weep any longer, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him because they knew that the child was dead. But he took her by the hand and called to her, Child, arise. This is the famous Talita Kum. Talita Kum. Talita Kum. And then her breath. Nobody knows. Nobody called it how many were raised from the tomb. 
Imagine if you have your mother, your father, your abuelo, your abuelo, your grandparents, and then all of a sudden, you, you see them back to life? Okay, now uh, we move on uh, from the gospel, everything from everything we're or from the gospel. Now uh, we move on to the uh, to the Acts of the Apostles. You know the Bible. You know the Bible. So uh, uh, this is from Acts uh, chapter nine, verses thirty-six to forty-three. So um, I don't know if you can read, but I will just read it for you. Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was completely occupied with the deeds and almsgiving. Now during those days she felt sick and died. So after washing her, they laid her out in her room upstairs. The disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him with a request to please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. When he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs where all the widows came to him, weeping and showing him the tunics and the clothes that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. Then he turned to her body and said, Kavitha, rise up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up and sat up. He gave her his hand and raised her up, and when he had pulled the holy ones in the widows, he presented her alive. Amen. It's me. No, I'm liking this. I mean, this is our resurrection story that will lift our spirits. Oh, this is very interesting. Yutikos. Who knows Yutikos? Yutikos is, you um, can read the story of Yutikos in Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 7 to 12. You know, uh, for, for some reason's sake, uh, Pope Francis would like us to, to preach uh, short homilies. Huh? We should not be preaching more than seven minutes. You know what? And, and, and uh, perhaps a Pope Francis had in mind what happened in, uh, with, uh, with the Eagles. You know, St. Paul was going from one place to another. So at that night, uh, but that night was the last night of St. Paul before he would leave to another place. So he took the opportunity to be talking and talking and preaching the whole night. A lot of people were surrounding him, and Eutychus was seated in the window of the second floor. Perhaps, I don't know if it was boring, but or, or it was really, um, it was very midnight that um, Eutychus was very tired. Eutychus fell. And Eutychus died. So, so what happened? A St. Paul, um, St. Paul, he said, all we are, there is life in him. And they took the boy away from life and were immeasurably comforted. So I hope nobody will fall from your chairs when I'm talking. Because I don't know how to raise people from dead people back to life. I'm not sick. Corinthians 15, 12, 21, 
to Corinthians 2, 14 to 15, Romans 6, verses 5 to 6, etc. Because there are a lot. Anyway, so now to wrap up. The singular phenomenon of Jesus' resurrection. You know why it's singular? It's one of its kind. It's unique. Because all those who were resurrected by the prophets, Elijah, Elisha, by St. Paul, by Peter, and our Lord Jesus Christ, they all die again. They all die again. And were not resurrected the second. They remain in the tomb. Even those who are from uh, rising from the cracks, from their crack tombs, no? they die again. But the Lord Jesus Christ, when he is risen, he did not die again. Jesus Christ is alive. I hate to say hallelujah because we're still because we're still in, in land and uh, I'm moved to say hallelujah. This is a this is a great uh, great uh, truth of our faith. Now, the news of the resurrection was given to us through the empty tomb. Why do we know that our Lord Jesus Christ was risen from the dead? Because he was not there in the tomb anymore. <laughs> well, if he was there in the tomb, then he, then he did not rise. So the empty tomb in itself is not a direct proof of the resurrection, but the absence of Christ's body from the tomb could, could be explained could, could be explained otherwise. Now we know also of um, the resurrection of our Lord because He appeared to many people, and and uh, He appeared first of all to Mary Magdalene, and that's the reason why this is. The, this, this, this is the reason why that Mary Magdalene was told by Pope Francis and even other, other experts of our faith that Mary Magdalene is the apostle of the apostles. Apostle of the apostles. You know, what's the, what's the, what's the most important message that the apostles were proclaiming, were preaching? The resurrection of our Lord. And so that's why when they were um, for, for Judas, they had to elect someone to replace Judas because they had to be 12. What's the criteria? He must have a bachelor's degree, he must have, um, he must be a US citizen, he must be. No. There was just one, one requirement. And this is the very characteristic of the apostles. Who the apostles are? They are the ones who witness the resurrection of our Lord. And so that's why they took uh, two candidates to be to replace uh, Judas. And again, I cannot overemphasize this. The only criteria for them to be a candidate of, of uh, to replace Judas is they must have to be the witness of the resurrection. And so then, if Mary Magdalene is the first one to witness the, the, the resurrection, and she was the one who told the apostles, I have seen the Lord. So by saying so, she became the apostle of the apostles. I think uh, the document uh, signed by Pope Francis to proclaim that um, the feast day of uh, Mary Magdalene is uh, July 22nd. So it's not anymore a ordinary feast. It is a special feast. To declare that, I think the first words of the document is Apostle of the Apostles. And who is that? <laughs> we acknowledge the presence of our pastor, Mary Reverend Father Ryan Dowd. <laughs> Now, the, what does the Catholic, so the Catholic Church is teaching us of 
the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Catholics, you know, if you if you need to know our faith, if you have questions of our faith, all questions of our faith can be resolved by the Catholicism of the Catholic Church. If the Catholicism of the Catholic Church cannot solve it, it's because your problem does not exist. Now, uh, Catholicism, that's why you all, if we have the Bible, we must have also in our in our homes the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, Catechism, number 638. I would like to read. The resurrection of Jesus is the crowning truth. Emphasize even on crowning truth of our faith in Christ. A faith in Eve and Eve as the central truth by the first Christian community handed on as fundamental by tradition. Established by the documents of the New Testament and preached as an essential part of the pastoral mystery along the cross. I think it's now clear. Really, the truth of the resurrection of our Lord is the crowning truth. More truth than that, higher truth than that, there is no nothing more. It is the central truth. It is the fundamental truth. And it is essential truth. Amen. Yeah. 